Well, good morning and welcome to the Bridge City First Assembly online Easter worship experience. We're so glad that you have chosen to worship the Lord together with us today, the risen Savior. And what a great, great time we're going to have together today. Why don't we invite the Lord to be here with us during this special time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, wonderful day that we get to celebrate you. It's a day of hope. It's a day of life. It's a day of joy. And today we want to worship you with everything that we are. And Lord, though we're separated by distance, we come together here today virtually to worship you, to honor you, to draw close to you. May you meet each one of us right where we are in Jesus' name. And if you agree with that prayer, say, that's what I want. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together with some music this morning.
during this part of the service, we like to give an opportunity to worship the Lord with giving. And we want to say thank you for being faithful givers to Bridge City First Assembly. Really, you're giving to the Lord. You're just giving through the church to be able to make a difference in our world. And we're so glad that you have. And I just want to encourage you with this thought today that, you know, you can never outgive God. Uh, just this week as we've been packing up things to move. Uh, there have been a few things that we're selling online and, uh, and some of the stuff happens to be the boys. And so of course they get the money for those things that are theirs that they sell. And uh, in particular, Austin had sold an item this week. And uh, right off the bat, we talked about how much money we'd have and then about taking out that part that's the tithe, that top 10% off the increase that we have in life and giving that to the Lord. And, and the boys are, are willing to do that. They understand the importance and the value of it. And so uh, Austin gave that. Well, right after that, there was something else that he wanted to buy online. He's going to have to order it. And it was in a situation where he could make an offer that was less than what was being asked for. And he did, and he saved about three times the amount when the person accepted his offer, he saved about three times the amount that he had just paid and tithe. And you know what? He put that together in his mind and understood that when you're faithful to God, he's faithful to you. I'm not saying it's always going to work out exactly like that for you, but as you give today, I want to encourage you to know that God is going to come through for you and say thanks again. And so I pray God's blessing on you now as you give during this time. Well, you know that I like to start with a joke before lots of my messages. And so here's one that I thought that you would particularly enjoy. Uh, back in the day, there was a preacher who uh, would stand at the back door of the church and shake hands with every person as they were leaving the church. And uh, he happened after one Easter service to see uh, a man who was not there very often in the services. And so as the man came through, he grabbed him by the hand, pulled him aside and said, Sir, you need to be in the army of the Lord. And the man replied to him, Preacher, I am in the army of the Lord. And he said, Well, then how come I only see you at Christmas and on Easter? The man looked nervously around, leaned in quietly and said, because I'm in the secret service. <laughs> oh, well, I thought you'd enjoy that one. And uh, we're glad for you to join us whenever you join us. And whether you're joining us online or, man, when we get back together, you're joining us in person. It's going to be a great time. Hey, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning and invite Him to be a part of this time as we look into His Word and see what He has to say to us from his word today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Uh, just as you rose from the dead, as you sprung back into life, Lord, let your word uh, spring back to life for us during this time as we hear it. May it resonate with our spirit, Lord, and may we be drawn closer to you. I pray, Lord, that you would heal hurts today, that you would restore and revive and resurrect in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you for several moments today uh, about the topic of scars. Scars. And when I was a kid in elementary school uh, there in Pasadena, I would on a number of occasions ride my bike to school. And uh, I'd ride to school back after school. And one particular day, I was riding home with some of my friends. And we took a, a shortcut, a back uh, way that was called, we called it the shell path. And we got on our bicycles and we we're riding along. And somewhere there along the shell path, we decided that we were going to race back to our homes. And so uh, I, I lived just about a block away from Wally and Scott, and Brian lived about another block or so beyond me, but we were all going to race uh, to this certain point. And so, man, we took off. And about the time that we actually hit pavement, uh, as we got closer to our houses, 
I took the lead. Now, I didn't have the cool BMX bike that most of my friends had, you know. I had uh, an electric blue Schwinn. I mean, that thing was heavy and it had the long banana seat and it had the long handlebars and everything. But man, I was riding like the wind that day. I was blowing them away. And as I rode, uh, I got further further ahead. I was about a half a block ahead of my friends. I passed Wally and Scott's house, and I was about halfway between their house and my house. I realized I was victorious. I took my hands off the handlebars, was riding along, when all of a sudden, my wheel hit something, and the handlebars turned somewhat, and the bike just stopped on a dime. Well, my body gave in to physics and did not stop when the bike stopped. I went flying through and over the handlebars and I could not get my hands out in front of me fast enough. And so my chin was the first thing to hit the concrete road and start skidding along there. My hands caught up and skidded along with my chin, but I screamed so loud like a little girl that my friends who had just made it to their house about a block behind me never stopped riding at their house and they just rode all the way up to me and when they got to me they realized i had wrecked on my bike and so they started helping me up and they looked at my face when they lifted me up and they said oh man alan you're bleeding pretty badly and i took my scraped hand and i put it to my chin and when i pulled it back I was aware that they had not lied to me. There was a pretty good amount of blood on my hands. I was crying and shaking. And, and so uh, one of my friends got my bike and, and one of my friends kind of helped me along and they walked me the rest of the way to my uh, home. And uh, they knocked on the door and my dad answered the door. Mom was gone out of town for something. I don't remember what it was, but she wasn't there right then. And dad asked what happened. My friend told him a story and and dad thanked them for helping me get home and, and and then he brought me inside and began to clean me up and as he got me in the bathroom and he was cleaning me up and getting the blood off and seeing what was really going on you know we probably should go get stitches in that but neither one of us wanted that and so he just bandaged it up the best he could, cleaned it up, bandaged it up, cleaned up my hands and everything, and let it go. And sure enough, it healed up over time. And uh, But for the longest while, I had a scar right there on my chin. And uh, I guess it's gone away from too much shaving or something. I don't know. But, but I had that scar there and can't really see it anymore. It wasn't too bad. Well, hit the forward button there a little bit on the story of my life. Jump ahead about two decades or so, and it was the first day of the first summer camp that I was ever going to lead as the state youth director for the Assemblies of God in Louisiana. And uh, some kids had come into the office. We were still during the registration time, and some kids had come into the office and said, there's kids out on the skate pipe who won't, they get up there, but they won't go down and skate, and it's holding up the rest of us. And so my assistant and I decided we would go out and check it out, see what was going on with it. And so we went out and uh, talked to them, find out what was going on. Sure enough, kids would get up there and they'd be scared. And I said, why are you scared? I said, because we're going to fall. And I said, well, you got a helmet on and you got elbow pads and knee pads. Come on, everybody falls. That's part of skateboarding. Just go ahead and go for it. You're going to do this. And I don't know if I can, you know. So finally, we decided that we needed to show them that it was okay to get up there and try and fall, you know, be good leaders and really inspire them. And so I borrowed somebody's helmet and elbow pads and knee pads and skateboard. And as I got up to the top deck there to be able to go down the, the skate pipe, then uh, I asked one of the guys, now, how do I do this? And the kid looks at me with wide eyes. He goes, you've never dropped in before? I was like, no, I, I haven't. And he said, you sure you want to do this? I was like, Psh. I'm going to fall. I get it. That's the whole point to show everybody that you can fall and get back up. And, and so he tells me, he said, okay, you put the back part of the skateboard on the edge there and you put the rest of it out here and you get your body's weight on the back. And then when you're ready, you lean real far forward 
far as you can. And you go down because if you don't, you're going to fall backwards. So counted to three and I dropped in. And I thought I leaned forward far enough, but I didn't. And again, physics took over. The skateboard went out from underneath me. I fell down and this time my hand hit first. And right there, right in the, that part of the palm of my hand right there, there was a jagged piece of the wood sticking up on that skate pipe. And when I came down, it jabbed me right there. And I stopped, my hand stopped and it caught and I pulled it out and it hurt so badly. This time I didn't scream like a little girl because I was too embarrassed to do that. But, uh, but man, I tell you what, it was bleeding and it was bleeding pretty good. And I went to the camp nurse and uh, and showed her what was going on. She goes, well, you're going to have to go to the emergency room and get stitches. And I was like, no way, I'm not getting stitches. And she says, you got to, it's not optional. And so she cleaned me up the best she could. And I was the very first person that I had to send to the emergency room while I was leading camps ever. And it was, uh, it was a crazy time. I got about four or five stitches in there. That seems like nothing probably to some of you, uh, because you know, when we're comparing scars some are more serious some of you have had like heart surgery where you've had like your old chest is like you know and there's a scar there you know or some some of you ladies maybe have had to have a c-section there's like scar you know from all of that and so my scars don't sound like much compared to your scars not all scars are created equal are they I remember one time when I was in my early 20s, our church was going to have a float in the parade there in our town. And so our youth pastor got about five or six of us guys to come up there one evening and help him work on the float. And as we were doing that, somebody hurt themselves and got nicked up a little bit or something and, be, you know, kind of oohed and And so we began to tell stories about how we had gotten hurt and would begin to show the scars from those times when we got hurt. And, you know, I, I'd tell a story and then my friend Mike would tell a story and then somebody else would tell a story and then Mike would tell a story and then somebody else would tell a story and then Mike would tell a story until, you know, this went on for a while and in between every person just about, Mike was telling a story about when he got hurt and showing us the scars from those incidents when he got hurt. And pretty soon we all ran out of stories and Mike just just kept going and we begin to laugh every time he would say and then there was the time when I and tell the story and show the scar and it was just one of those things where we just thought it was so funny because he had so many more scars than we did that it wasn't even a comparison almost. Now, not all scars are created equal. Some of us have more, some of us have less, but the truth is we all have scars. And another truth is we can't see a lot of the scars that we have. We have emotional scars. We have mental scars. We have relational scars. There were those times when we've been rejected or neglected. There are those times when we have been proverbially slapped in the face or stabbed in the back. And maybe every one of us has had an emotional face plant on the concrete of life as we encountered something negative all of a sudden and most of us have probably had an opportunity where we have launched off the skate pipe of life only to have the skateboard of life go out from underneath us and incur a hard hit and you know, the truth is, we all hurt, we all have pains, we all have scars. Scars that we don't always necessarily want to show. Scars that, if we were to be honest, we don't even want God to see. Because we think our scars somehow make us less than. And the truth is, some of our scars really have come from times when maybe it was our own fault. I mean, the truth is, I probably shouldn't have taken my hands off the handlebars. The truth is, I probably should have let somebody else show kids how to skateboard and drop in since I had never done it before. It was my own fault that I had those scars. But I love these lyrics from an 
old song written by Gloria Gaither. And I didn't really know these lyrics. I came across them recently, heard somebody share them. And it said this, somebody speaking to the Lord and said, I said, if you knew me, you wouldn't want me. My scars are hidden by the face I wear. Wow, isn't that true that so often we put on a smiling face for everybody when underneath is hurt and scars. But I love that Gloria doesn't stop with those two lines. She goes on and she writes these words from Jesus back to the individual. He said, my child, my scars go deeper. It was love for you that put them there. You know, the truth is this. Resurrection is really about scars. It's about a scarred Savior. When Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took Jesus' body off the cross and they uh, put the ointments and the spices and everything on his body for the embalming process and they wrapped him in linen cloth, there were a lot of wounds, a lot. There were wounds on his head from where those long thorns had pierced through the skin and into the flesh. There were scars uh, on his back from his shoulder down to his legs where they had whipped him mercilessly, shredding apart his entire back, probably to the point where you could see through to his insides, his very, very big wounds there. And then there were scars in his hands, his wrists, scars in his, I mean, wounds in his feet where they had nailed him to the cross. And then there was a wound where, where he had been stabbed in the side, up under the ribs, up into the lining of his heart, the pericardial lining, and, and that's where blood and water flowed. And, and so when they buried him, he had all these wounds. In fact, probably by the time they buried him, there was little to no blood left. But on Sunday morning, that very first Easter, when the stone was rolled away, to show that the Savior was no longer there, that He had already risen. Did you know that on that Sunday morning, He no longer had wounds, He had scars. There were only scars now where the wounds used to be. And scars are what remain. Scars are what remain behind to show us that the wound has healed, that it no longer poses a threat to us in any way. And when Jesus resurrected, He resurrected as a scarred Savior, uh, not a wounded Savior, a scarred Savior on our behalf. Now, Scripture tells us, John writes this, that in, on Sunday evening, that Easter, that very first Easter, the disciples were locked in a room. They were hiding. They were scared for their lives. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Jesus shows up in the room. We don't know if he, if he walked through the wall. We don't know if he, uh, if he just materialized like Star Trek. We don't know, but he wasn't in the room, and then he was in the room, and he's right there with him, and he shows himself to the self-quarantining disciples, right? How many of you know you're a self-quarantining disciple? And so they're, they're locked in that room, and he comes in, and he's, he says, hey, guys, I'm here. And this is what he says to him. It says, John says that he showed them the wounds in his hands and his feet. Now, when he showed them those, what he was showing them actually were scars. It wasn't like he was showing, him ble showing them bleeding wounds. It wasn't like he was saying they weren't infected or red or any of that kind of stuff. No, he was in his resurrected body. He was whole. He, he just had scars where there used to be wounds. And his scars said to them that day that he had overcome the pain. He had overcome the hurts. He was no longer hurting. He was no longer suffering. Oh, sure, the scars reminded him what had happened. I mean, he knew that he had been uh, beaten and he knew that he had been hit with a stick and slapped and punched. He knew that his beard had been ripped out. He knew that he had been nailed and beaten and 
getting stabbed. I mean, he knew all of that. But more than the fact that they reminded him of what had happened, they spoke that what had hurt him had not defeated him. You know, before he died, Jesus said to his disciples, in this world, you will have troubles. You'll have difficulties. You'll have problems. You'll have challenges. You'll have things that, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And that's what his scars said. It's like he said to him, see, I've overcome the world. I've overcome, guys. Look at this. You, you saw how wounded I was, but there's no wounds anymore. There's just scars. And they may have beaten me, but look at the scars. I'm over it. I've overcome. They may have nailed me to a cross, but look at the scars. I've overcome. They may have stabbed me, but look at the scars. I've overcome. I overcame it all. Man, what a powerful truth that he had overcome what people had done to him. And people had done a lot of bad things, not just physical things. He had experienced the hurt of betrayal, the hurt of denial, people abandoning him in his moment of greatest need. And yet he was saying to them, I've overcome it all. I'm, I'm not letting that stop me. I'm going forward with who I am, with who I was designed to be. I'm going to take it a step further with you right now this morning. Jesus went on to say to them after he showed them uh, scars where his wounds used to be, he said to them, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Uh, that's a pretty big statement because all these guys had backed out on him pretty much except John and and they had all taken off and left him. And, and it's not like he walked into the room and went, Aha! I've got you, you dirty scoundrels. I, I knew I'd find you here quivering and hiding. Let me tell you something. He doesn't read them the riot act. He doesn't chastise them for abandoning him or denying him. He says, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. All is forgiven. Yeah, you wounded me emotionally. Yeah, you wounded me relationally. Yeah, you bailed out on me when I needed you most, but I have scars that say I overcame that too. You know what? You may have done that, but, but that's okay. It's all taken care of. It's all forgiven. And Jesus showed him that he had overcome his own hurts, his own wounds, but he doesn't stop there. I love this. He doesn't stop there. He goes on, and I think his scars didn't just show them that he had overcome his wounds, his hurts from the past, but I think they said to them that it would help them overcome their wounds as well. He would help them overcome. Years later, the Apostle Peter would, uh, would quote, uh, the prophet Isaiah. He was writing, Peter was writing a letter to some New Testament believers, and when he did, he quoted Isaiah, and he quoted this verse that's pretty familiar to most of us who have been in church, but maybe if you haven't been in church, you don't know it. And he says, by his stripes, talking about Jesus, by his beating, by his wounding, by that part of the atonement of his sacrifice for us, by his stripes, we were healed. And I know Peter was talking about, uh, about physical healing. He was talking about uh, all kinds of healing that happened from that. But I also believe that his scars, Jesus' scars, those wounds that he in, uh, incurred and that turned into scars, help heal the other pains that we experience in life too. And lots of times we'll share that when we're praying for people. We'll say, maybe you're here today with a physical need and you need healing, but maybe you're also here with an emotional need or a relational need and you need healing. And we'll pray because I believe it covers that too. In his book, Double Blessing, Mark Batterson uh, writes these words, every scar tells a story of pain, but scars are also evidence of obstacles overcome. And it's those scars that God will use to help others heal. Remember doubting Thomas? His doubt met its match in the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. And when 
Jesus encountered those early disciples and he was trying to help them overcome. Listen, they had some stuff to overcome. Thomas had his doubt. Peter had the brokenness of knowing he had denied Jesus just like Jesus said he would. And Peter had been like, no, I'm going to die for you if I have to. And sure enough, he didn't. And now he's got brokenness over that. The other disciples had the shame of just running away and leaving Jesus all by himself to suffer when they had promised that they would stand with him. For all of them, they had fear in their life. But as they met the scarred Savior, he was saying, Thomas, you don't have to doubt anymore. Look at the scars. He was saying, Peter, you don't have to be broken anymore. Come on, I can heal that. Look at the scars. You can get past it. He was saying to all of them, you don't have to fear anymore. You don't have to live in shame anymore. Come on, I can heal that in your life. He was saying to them, hurt and pain and injury are not the end of the story. Man, that is the message of Easter, isn't it? His scars say it's okay to love again. It's okay to dream again. It's okay to believe again. It's okay to try again. It's okay to hope again. That, that's the message of Easter, hope. Easter equals hope. That's the message of a scarred Savior. I love that Scripture doesn't say, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross, you'll be saved. It doesn't say, if you believe that he was buried in a tomb, you'll be saved. No. Scripture says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we'll be saved. It's resurrection that makes Jesus different. There's no other deity who has died who has resurrected. There's no other deity who's been wounded, who got over those wounds and has the scars to prove that they survived it. None but Jesus. None but Jesus. I love the story of Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby is a great, was a great, great hymn writer in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Wrote songs like Blessed Assurance and uh, some other great ones. Just wrote hundreds and thousands of, of songs for the church over the years. Well, when she was only six weeks old, Fanny J. Crosby uh, went blind. And so she spent the rest of her life living with that blindness. And there were times when people would say, Fanny, don't you wish that you could see again? Don't you wish that God would heal you right now? And she would reply to them, no, I, I, I don't mind if I'm blind all the way to heaven because I want the first face that I see to be my Savior, Jesus. She loved Him so much. Well, one day, She's walking down uh, uh, the a street in a crowded city, uh, someone guiding her by the arm, helping her to get where she's going. When she hears ahead of them on a street corner, a man hollering out loud, preaching on the street corner, but he's telling everybody that he was Jesus, that he was the Son of God, and that he was the Messiah, and that they should listen to him because he's Jesus Christ. And she asked the person guiding her, would you, would you take me over there to where that man is preaching that we can hear? And so the person did. They took him over there and she asked the man, she said, excuse me, you say that you're Jesus Christ. And he stops and says, yes. She said, may I feel your hands? And he sticks out his hands to her and she feels him. She turns to the person who is guiding her and she says, that's not my Jesus. He has no scars. He has no scars. Listen, our Savior is a scarred Savior. And His scars say, I might have been knocked down, but I wasn't knocked out. His, his scars say, I overcame. 
And his scars say to us, come on, show me your scars. And I'll show you victory over that pain, over that hurt, over that injury of how someone did you wrong. Listen, I don't know what struggle you're wrestling with today. I don't know what wounds inflicted you. I don't know what hurts left a mark. Maybe you know the pain of having a spouse walk out the door on you and leave you for good. Maybe you know the hurt of having a boss or a company tell you, you know, we just don't need you anymore. Maybe you've had a friend who turned their back on you when you needed them most. I don't know. Are you dealing with doubt? Look at the scars. Are you fighting fear? Look at the scars. Are you battling bitterness? Look at the scars. Are you saddled with shame? Look at the scarred Savior and have a hope today. He overcame and He will help you overcome that same scarred Savior who walked into a room nearly 2,000 years ago to tell other believers, I'll help you overcome the pain in your life like I overcame it in my life, is ready to walk into the room wherever you are watching this video at the moment, and He's ready to say the same thing to you. He's ready to say, take a look at my scars. They say I've overcome. Take a look at my scars. My own hurts are now healed. I've overcome them and I will help you overcome yours as well. He'll say to you, I see your scars and I proclaim over you that they are no longer simply going to be reminders of the hurts of the past in your life, but they are now going to be symbols of how I helped you overcome Reminders of how I didn't let you get taken out. How I didn't let the enemy stop you. And maybe for too long, those scars have only reminded you of how badly you were hurt. And all you can think about when you see them is the injury and the loss and the pain. But by the power of the risen Savior I serve, I believe and declare that if you will show your scars to the scarred Savior today, He will help you overcome the memories of hurt from the past, the pain, the injury, and He will cause those scars to become a testimony of how He helped you overcome as well by the power of the resurrection. I'd love to pray with you right now because maybe you are facing some kind of hurt or pain from the past that you can't seem to let go of. Maybe you have some sense of loss in your life and you just don't think that you can handle it. Easter, an empty tomb, a risen Savior, a scarred Savior, says you can. You can overcome. You can be transformed. He can heal the hurt. You can let go of the past. And you can go forward in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone watching this message right now, regardless of when or where. And I pray that, Lord, in this moment, by the power of your Spirit, you would walk into the room where they are at. And regardless of how many scars they have, regardless of how deep the scars are that they have, I ask you to bring healing to those. God, transform wounds into scars and let there be healing where there was hurt in the past. Let there be hope where there was pain and loss. Thank you for keeping your scars so that we would know we could overcome too. We love you and we give you thanks. Hey, listen, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ before, this is the perfect opportunity. He's not dead, he's alive. 
plenty of verification to be able to show that to you. Won't take the time right now, but we can do that. But if you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ before, or you have and you've walked away from that relationship, can I just tell you, he walked back into the room with people that had turned their backs on him in a big way. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter how far you've gone. He'll take you back. He'll wrap you in his arms of love. Let a scarred Savior hug you today and welcome you back into the family. You just pray a simple prayer that says, Dear Lord, here I am. I've sinned. I've blown it. I believe that you paid the price and the penalty for my sin. Not only that, I believe that when you died, God raised, raised you back to life. And I want you to be in charge of my life. Be the boss of me. Call the shots. Help me get it right from now on instead of getting it wrong. I love you and I'll serve you the rest of my days. If you just pray a simple prayer like that, can I just tell you, you just got born again, you just got saved, you just started a new life in Christ. We'd love to walk that journey with you. Would you comment below and let us know that you made that decision? Somebody will contact you. We'll pray with you. If you need resources, we'll try to do what we can to help you. But we love you and we believe in you and God's going to help you. I pray that each of you have a great week, a resurrected week, a powerful week, an overcoming week, and that God would be with you. I look forward to us all being back together again as soon as we possibly can. I love you. God bless you. 